The fighting game genre has seen many contenders come and go over the years. Some were game changers, pardon the pun, some were excellent adaptations of these game changers, some were unique entries that built smaller cult followings, and the rest generally faded away. Those who survived often had more than one variant enter the fray. A sequel meant new pressures placed upon developers to not only meet the standards set by the previous game, but to expand on it. Doing this successfully many times over helped etch the game's place in video game history. One franchise that encapsulates this in amazing fashion is the Tekken series, an incredible lineup of games that proves even a kangaroo beating the tar out of a panda bear while tag teaming with a carefully crafted piece of wood older than the Deku Tree can be immensely entertaining. My name is Aaron, and today we shall examine the franchise's introduction to the gaming world during the mid-90s. This is a tale of the original Tekken. In the early 1990s, the popularity in head-to-head -head fighting games was increasing dramatically in the arcade scene. After the 1980s presented a plethora of games focused primarily on high scores, the concept of beating the opponent standing next to you into submission, in a virtual setting of course, proved to be quite an adrenaline rush. At this time, 2D fighters such as Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, Art of Fighting, and Fatal Fury had won players over thanks in large part to their unique presentations and distinct features. With visuals and gameplay mechanics improving at such a rapid pace, gaming developers would work feverishly to stay ahead of everyone else. One of these developers was Namco, a Japanese company that got its start in the mid-1950s as a hotspot for department store rooftop entertainment. Nakamura Manufacturing Company, named after its founder, Masaya Nakamura, would abbreviate its name into the term widely known by video game fans in June 1977. From there, Namco would carve out an impressive legacy of arcade games throughout the 1980s with the likes of Galaxian, Pac-Man, Galaga, and Dig Dug. So impressive, in fact, that a portion of these games currently rival the likes of Tetris and Skyrim for being re-released across several generations of gaming devices. It was during this time that Namco began to prospect their ambitions of the future, a new reality where video games would successfully transcend into the realm of 3D. Veteran Tekken designer and producer Masahiro Kimoto recalled, It was obvious to practically everyone that in the near future, 3D fighters would replace the currently popular 2D ones. Namco believed that this era of polygon-based games would continue for the next several decades. Namco also thought that regardless of the genre of game, the ability to create 3D humanoid character models with complex rigging and use a massive amount of animation data to animate them is technology that would definitely be necessary moving forward. Three years of hard work from 1985 to 1988 resulted in Namco's first 3D gaming showcase, the Namco System 21. Nicknamed the Polygonizer, this new board made it possible for Namco to introduce ambitious 3D titles like Winning Run, Galaxian 3, and Star Blade. After a few years of updating the board and continuing the 3D trend, Namco encountered a worthy challenger. Enter Sega and their new Model 1. It was with the help of this innovative board that introduced the world to the original Virtua Fighter, a wonderfully crafted commencement of the exciting new possibilities in the fighting game genre. The new fighter would quickly earn Sega its own period of dominance in the 3D gaming realm. Ironically, Virtua Fighter also proved to be a turning point for the direction of Sony's first dive into the console scene. In the years leading up to the release of the original PlayStation, Sony was unsure whether to continue in the cemented direction of 2D or tread into the growing popularity of 3D. With consoles of the era being primarily presented in the former, this was a huge decision to make. In a pinch, Sony realized their choice with the help of Virtua Fighter. Ryoji Akagawa, formerly a producer for Sony Computer Entertainment, recalled, if it wasn't for Virtual Fighter, the PlayStation probably would have had a completely different hardware concept. Namco would soon partner with Sony in this new direction. To aid their efforts of porting over arcade titles to this new system, Namco decided to develop a new board based on the hardware of the PS1 while simultaneously sacrificing some of the power found in previous boards. Now armed with the Namco System 11, the company was determined to make another impact in the realm of 3D and have their new fighter made in time for the launch 
of the PlayStation. Namco formed the Tekken Project team, a combination of established developers outside of the company and newcomers from within to work on their upcoming fighter. One of these experienced individuals brought into the fold as the director was none other than Seiichi Ishii, one of the creators of the original Virtua Fighter. This right here explains a lot, doesn't it? Also, one of the newcomers brought into the Tekken project was none other than future Tekken producer Katsuhiro Harada. With time rapidly flying by, Namco put lots of pressure on the team to deliver the new game. It's been documented that the entire process was immensely grueling and cutthroat. Underperforming staff members were disciplined by way of immediate dismissal. While conducting my research for this video, I came across this factoid that I had no idea about. Apparently, during the project phase, the game was originally slated to be called Kamui. I may have pronounced it wrong, but there it is on the screen. Due to copyright, they could not use this name for long. Also, a story from December 1994 in Electronic Gaming Monthly previewing the game for American players showcases another familiar title. Fans of the popular Ridge Racer will instantly remember that name being tattooed on one of the game's vehicles. The original Tekken was released in the Japanese arcade scene in December 1994 and international arcades in May 1995. Namco had missed the mark on porting over the game in time to the PlayStation at launch, but at least they had a product out there. The game, naturally, features a similar presentation to Virtua Fighter. However, there are some notable differences, the most crucial being the control scheme. Unlike the three-button scheme to punch, kick, and block, Tekken implemented controls mapped out in accord with the character's limbs. The top two buttons are for punches, and the bottom two buttons are for kicks. One is left punch, two is right punch, three is left kick, and four is, you're right, the right kick. Pressing 1 and 3 simultaneously resulted in one of two generic throw attempts, the other being activated with 2 and 4 pressed at the same time. Certain characters are able to perform extra throws via alternative button combinations. All of these attacks present the following hit properties, high, low, and mid. Similarly to 2D fighting games, players must hold back on the joystick to block highs and mids. To block lows, the player must hold down back to crouch and block. High punches and kicks can also be ducked. As for defending against throws, you can either duck or backdash away as fast as you can. There are no throw breaks in the original Tekken. Speaking of movement with the joystick, there are more properties to take note of here. The player can aim forward, back, down back, down forward, up forward, and up back, with the final two motions resulting in a hysterical showcase of elevation. Combine these motions with some of the attack buttons and you have yourself a plethora of moves to choose from. To perform lows, you'd aim downward with the joystick while hitting an attack button. For mids, down forward and an attack. You get the idea. There are also some intricate movements the player has to perform to pull off some unique moves, such as Law Slide and the Mishima Hell Sweeps. Playing this game now occasionally will make you feel as if your character is in quicksand, but for its time, the movement is decent. Of course, the objective in the original Tekken is to knock out the opponent by chipping away at his or her health bar. You can also have the clock be your best friend and ensure you have a higher bar of health before time expires. In the arcade version, you have access to 8 characters, all of whom have unique twists of real-life fighting styles. What's more, a small animation plays when you choose your character. Yoshimitsu! A ninja who leads a group of vigilantes known as the Manji Clan. Side note about Yoshi. According to this Tekken 1 strategy guide, his favorite thing in the world is video games. Extra cool points, yes. Nina Williams! A blonde assassin hired specifically to kill the main antagonist in the game. More on that person later. Another side note, Nina's favorite thing ever is Tom and Jerry's Tom. He cannot make this up. Law the Dragon! This was initially Lawman's name, but it was changed to Martial Law before release to avoid potential likeness issues. The fascinating thing about this whole ordeal is the announcer's clip of Law the Dragon is still included in the sound files of the game. In the finished product, Namco cut out the Dragon, and all you hear is Law. This explains why it sounds like something was missing if you picked him in the character select screen. Anyhow, renowned as a homage to the late Bruce Lee, Law enters for the prize money to achieve his dream of opening up a dojo. What's his favorite thing, you ask? Money! 
Remember the Rave War name initially slated for Tekken? One of Law's moves ended up being called the Rave War Combo. Nice touch, Namco. Kazuya Mishima! Your main protagonist in the original Tekken who wants to defeat his father and take over the famed Mishima Zaibatsu. This dude apparently loves collecting sneakers on the side. Paul Phoenix! A pizza-loving judo powerhouse who can end a fight in mere seconds. He is also Kazuya's main rival here and is forever cemented in the minds of fans due to his unmistakable hairstyle. Jackass! A killer robot created by the Soviet Union. Kill anything through sheer force is the name of his game. Or its game. King! A simultaneous homage to professional wrestling legends Tiger Mask and Frey Tormenta, a vicious pro wrestler in his own right from Mexico, fighting in the name of orphans across the world. And finally, Michelle Chang! A lovely addition to the roster who seeks revenge against the main antagonist after his army murdered her father. All eight characters are playable in two different outfits. Pressing any of the two punch buttons activates the first one, and any of the two kick buttons activates the other. Once you've decided on this, the gameplay begins. It's remarkable how much this resembles its counterpart from Sega, while also retaining its own uniqueness. Some of these qualities include the lack of ringouts, and every stage taking place in outdoor spaces based on real-life locations, such as Cambodia, the Chiba Marine Stadium in Japan, Arizona, and Venice, Italy. By default, 40 seconds are on the clock, and the player must win two rounds to carry on. In my experience, the first three stages are pretty straightforward and allow any newcomer to adjust to the pace of the game. Stage 4 is really where the challenge begins. The computer will begin ducking highs and throw attempts like crazy, so it's best to mix it up with mids and lows as much as possible. Backdashing away from moves is also a good option, as it opens up counter hit opportunities for increased damage. This can be noticed on screen when the yellow ball of impact appears. Some of the close calls you encounter between rounds must be seen to be believed. In total, there are 9 stages to complete, with a different sub-boss for each character in Stage 8, but more on these later. Stage 9 is unquestionably the toughest. Your boss is none other than the owner of the Mishima Zaibatsu, the main antagonist, the strongest character in the game. Hey, Hachi Mishima! Good lord, is this difficult in the arcade version. A blistering mix of his son Gozuya's moves and Paul's death fist make him a pain for anyone. He also has a knack for rearranging necks, a power bomb, and a headbutt at essentially any time he wants. If you manage to overcome all of this and win, replays of each of your victories are presented in montage form, and new time records are saved forever, enabling the record holder to brag at his or her pals whenever the record screen pops up in between matches. These replays and name entries would end up becoming a tradition in the early days of Tekken, providing a true sense of accomplishment to the player, no matter how long it took. If I mentioned how funny it is to kill people with this moon jump kick, this is my favorite move to use against that stupid computer by far. Thank you, Mr. Ishii, for the obvious influence from Virtual Fighter. On to the PlayStation version. Japan got this in March 1995, while America and Europe had to wait until November 95. This would become a pattern Namco would follow for years to come with future installments. Arcade first, console second. What stands out here? First up, we have a blast from the past. Galaga! You have the option of playing through each of the challenging stages from the arcade classic while the game loads. Initially, it may appear like a simple nod to Namco's history and nothing else. However, this does have a purpose. If you achieve a perfect score in all eight stages, you unlock Gozuyo's alter ego, Devil Gozuyo. At the time of this recording, I still have not been able to do this. There's still a way to see him in action without unlocking him, but more on this later. An intro video that was never featured in arcades is then shown after all the Galaga a showcase of each of the eight starter characters mentioned earlier, and a brief visual aid of their backstories. 
time has certainly not been kind to this intro, but it's still an important glimpse into where gaming was quickly headed in the mid-90s. Behold, the primitive Tekken 1 menu. Arcade mode presents the same 9-stage experience you get in front of a cabinet. 2P player mode is the versus mode against another human, and test mode provides you access to the options, records, and save data. In options, there is a choice of difficulty ranging from easy, medium, hard, very hard, and ultra hard. This would also become a staple in the series going forward. Another cool option is BGM Select, allowing you to set the soundtrack you want to hear while fighting. Choices include the original tracks from the arcade version and alternative renditions of those tracks arranged exclusively for the PlayStation. For those wanting an experience resembling the arcade cabinet as much as possible, Ultra Hard and the original music tracks are encouraged. No analog sticks for you. The record section is very basic and straightforward here. Even so, I can't help but feel this warm, fuzzy feeling inside of me every time I see these screens. It's almost like a time portal back to 1995, when things like this were state of the art. Probably. Once you've settled on the gameplay options, it's time to begin the only mode available to players playing by themselves, Arcade. Immediately, it's plainly obvious that this version was scaled back a bit when ported over to Sony's new machine. The character portraits are still shots here, paused on the very last frame of each character's animation from the arcades. It turns out that this was done in an effort to minimize load times and that Namco scaled back to 70% of what players experienced in arcades for the console port. Looking back, this was a crafty move on their part, even if some of the still shots are the equivalent of jump scare fuel. The core gameplay is impressively translated from cabinet to gamepad. The square, triangle, circle, and cross-button layout on the PlayStation controller was perfect for the limb-based combat, and the attacks respond well. You also retain the choice of two different outfits for each character, with some notable differences for Law and King. In the arcade version, Law had an outfit very reminiscent to the Bruce Lee tracksuit from Game of Death, with a giant O3 and the word Dragon on the back, as well as white shoes instead of the yellow and black ones that Bruce wore in the film, for potentially obvious reasons. On PS1, it looks as though Law is instead wearing some type of sweat jacket. Not nearly as cool, but still passable. For King, the arcade version featured a white top with red pants, while the PS1 version revised this with the more memorable blue top and white pants. Aside from these differences, the gameplay itself is largely untouched and is presented very well. Namco's plan to create the game based on the hardware of the PS1 had worked wonders. As mentioned earlier, you still have your 9 stages to fight through here, with the character-specific sub-bosses waiting for you in Stage 8. What's unique about beating arcade mode on the PlayStation is you actually unlock the sub-boss you defeat along the way. Kunimitsu, a Yoshimitsu clone that is the sub-boss for Michelle Chang. Armor King, a mentor to King who uses all of his moves with a twist. He also has access to uppercuts found in Gozuyo's moveset, making him even more fun. King's sub-boss, of course. Put Jackass. one of the ugliest things in the game that is both a clone and sub-boss for Jackass. The one move Pud Jackass. possesses that Jackass. doesn't is the power hammer move from Paul Phoenix. Kuma, the pet bear owned by Heihachi Mishima and the other ugliest thing in the game that is actually not a clone of his main adversary, Paul Phoenix himself. Instead, he's a clone of Jackass, good god, with the exception of his bear hug and headbutt. Li Chao Ling, who combines moves from Law and Paul with his own moves. His shin kicks and infinity kicks stand out the most, susceptible to losing composures if not properly studied. Li happens to be Gozuyo's sub-boss and stepbrother. The beef is real. Wan Jin Le, an older fighting veteran who shares much of Michelle Chang's moveset with the addition of Nina's blonde bomb and Paul's Death Fist. Architect of one of the funniest winning poses in the game. You win! <laughs> and sub-boss to Law the Dragon! Anna Williams, the sister of Nina who presents a mix of Nina's moves and Law's backflip. One of my favorites on the roster who has awesome winning poses that are thankfully still presented in the newest games today. Shake those 1994 boobs, Anna. 
Ganryu, a sumo wrestler who has his own unique moves along with remnants of Jackass Arsenal. Fantastic. And finally, hey, Hachi Mishima, granting you access to everything that may have ticked you off while trying to defeat him the first time. He's the last one unlocked in arcade mode and faces each sub-boss during his particular run. An excellent touch in my opinion. Remember earlier how I mentioned Devil Gozuya appears without unlocking him? Pick Heihachi and he will be your opponent in the final stage. Once you defeat the arcade mode on the PlayStation with one of the starting 8 characters, you are rewarded with an ending. These epilogues depict the events following the character's tournament victory. This would begin another tradition in the franchise, continuing on well into the new millennium. However, much like the console exclusive intro at the start of the game, time has not been kind to these whatsoever. Especially this ending for Law. Jeez, that's ugly. Unfortunately, sub-bosses do not get their own endings. Instead, you are taken straight to the credits after you win with one of those. While it would have been nice to see more than 8 endings, it certainly isn't surprising to only have 8 considering the rush Namco was on to feature Tekken on the PlayStation in the first place. Of all of the endings featured, which was accurate to the official story? To the lore! Our main protagonist, Gozuya, is a mere child. His father, Heihachi, realizes it's only a matter of time before his son is old enough to take over as the leader of the Mishima Zaibatsu. Understandably, he sets a high standard for the role and decides to test his son in a way that any loving father would. Young Gozuya is thrown directly off a cliff. Years later, Heihachi decides to pit the best fighters in the world against each other to crown the first King of Iron Fist. The original tournament is on, and its sponsor has little trouble defeating every challenger put in front of him. Fueled by revenge for the cliff incident, the now fully grown Gozuya is able to defeat his father and, well, roll the tape. Gozuya throws his pop off the same exact cliff. Impeccable! One final aspect worth diving into a bit more is the music. As alluded to earlier, the PlayStation version presents arranged tracks of the original arcade soundtrack. In this fan's opinion, regardless of BGM select choice, the music in the original Tekken is nothing short of phenomenal. For a game released in 1995, the tracks in the original Tekken still hold up tremendously. So much so, that I would say the music is easily the best thing about the original Tekken. When you look at how quickly the visuals have become antiquated, the music sounds like it came from a game released years later. The topic of Tekken music is one I look forward to covering more on the channel in the future. For now, I'll point out some of my favorites from this particular game. Arranged Shytown. Arcade Kyoto. Arranged Monument Valley. Arranged BG and Arcade Venezia. In my younger days, I leaned more towards the arcade version of the soundtrack, but nowadays, I prefer the arranged version as a whole. 
these tracks sound a lot more polished and full of life. After a decent response to Tekken from players in the arcade scene, the PlayStation version provided the boost Namco needed to have a hit on their hands. PS1 owners were so enthralled with this new fighter on console that it helped spread the popularity of Tekken in the arcades as well. The incentive to practice at home and test your skills against others at your local arcade must have been so enticing at the time. It's so easy to look back at this and poke fun at its primitive nature visually and mechanically, but at the time, the graphics were quite impressive, and the gameplay, although heavily influenced from its spiritual predecessor from Sega, began a journey towards its own unique identity. Every series and video games had to start somewhere, laying a foundation for the future. In my opinion, the original Tekken did this in spades. If you can get past the dated graphics and the now relatively snail-paced gameplay, there is still some fun to be had with this game. Coupled with amazing pieces of music and a true challenge, I am able to say that I still enjoy revisiting this game from time to time. With over a million units sold on the PlayStation, there was no question that Tekken had arrived and was here to stay. Prospects of a sequel seemed inevitable. A ninja who leads a group of vigilantes known as the Majima clan. Oh wait. No, this is not Yakuza. By default, 40 characters... Wow. <laughs> 40 characters are on the clock, and the player must win two rounds to carry on. Wow. Yeah, tremendous. What is this, a Dynasty Warriors game? In this fan's opinion, regardless of BGM select choice, the music in the original check-in is the... Damn it! <laughs> Crap. Check in.